a majority vote, again, no opposing votes, to get removed, it takes two-thirds of both sides. <laughs> so they, they figured out that we need, to, we need to protect the legislative order a little bit because he's got a hard job to do and some things he'll, he'll report on or, or create findings along the way. We don't create the findings, we just report the findings. It may make some people fat, uh, mad. Um, with that said, you know, it, it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm 57 years of age. I'm, I'm, I, you talk about the circle of life, and people ask, well, how'd you end up here? And I said, well, I'm, I'm not to the end yet, and so I don't want to say I'm closing on the circle of life, but you think about things that happen to you as a young person that kind of steer your conscience in what you become and what you do, et cetera. And I got to tell you this story. Many of you have, are you all familiar with the town of Golden Meta? A little town in Lower Lafouche, you may be driven through there. Well, it's, 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 known as a, it, it's known as a speed trap. I see some sheds shaking, uh, heads shaking. <laughs> and um, so I was about 17 years of age, and then I was senior in high school. And uh, back then, you could work a half day, you could go to school a half a day and go to work after. And I, I basically worked on my life. No, I, nobody steered me to play sports, so I got a job after school. Since the seventh grade, worked all my summers and holidays. Just I kind of enjoyed getting out of the house. The, the chaos of the house wasn't fun for me. I decided to go to work. And, and uh, so one day uh, after school, I show up at the office. My stepdad ran a dredging business. He says, we need to get some parts and supplies and groceries down to Leeville to dredge you know, bean number six or something like that. And he, he ran the bucket dredge division. I said, okay, now you look. When you get to Golden Meadow, there's going to be a flashing sign. You've got to slow down. Because that 45 on Highway 1 turns into a 25. So really? Okay. I wasn't paying attention. I'm a kid. Got the radio jacked up. I'm rolling. And uh, I had a heavy foot. I'm, I'll be honest with you. I guess that's why I ran for sheriff later. Um, <clears throat> so I'm rolling through there. And, and of course, I see the flash and sign, but it's too late. I'm probably 55 and at 25. Get pulled over. Lights and sirens. I get out. Yes, sir. And he starts checking everything. We got expired inspection stickers of company trucks. I didn't know. And you got a ticket, you're speeding. So this is going to be uh, 150 each, $300. That's cash. I'm like, cash? <laughs> Man, I, got, I, I don't have $10 in my pocket. I said, but I got a checkbook. You take a check? Nope, cash. I said, well, there's a bank right there. Can I run in there and see if they'll cash me a check? No, sir. So what are we going to do? You got to go to jail. So somebody brings the cash. I'm like, are you serious? And he was serious. He goes, follow, follow me. So I follow. Fortunately, they had a VHF radio in that truck. <laughs> And I called ahead to the dredge boat, and I said, guys, uh, I'm in a little bind here. I need you all to bring $300 cash at a landing. And the Bro Bridge captain kind of laughed and chuckled. And said, okay, boy, Chef, we'll get there. <laughs> and so we get to the jailhouse, and uh, they're checking me in, and, and they got their own couple little cell blocks in Golden Meadow. And he goes, I need your belt and your shoelace. I said, for what? Well, we, don't, we don't want you to hang yourself. <laughs> Stand, I'm true story. It's the standard protocol. The guy's following protocol. I give him my belt and she like, man, this is the real deal. He's going to really put me in there. I thought I was just going to wait in the office. So I stayed about a half hour, 45 minutes. The captain showed up and I walked in, uh, you know, they, they walked me out of the jail cell and he said, well, come in the mayor's office. And I peeled off $300 cash. And uh, lo and behold, about six months later, I was renewing my insurance and he run your record. Those two tickets weren't on the record. So it would, doesn't, probably doesn't take an auditor to figure out <laughs> that maybe that cash should not hit the books. But anyway, so part of what we do is, of course, we, we feel a lot of those type of complaints. But, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to, to assume this role and very honored. You know, we've got, uh, we've got a great office. A lot of folks don't know the size of this office. I have roughly 240 employees. Uh, or that's what I'm... I'm, I'm you know, my positions I have are assigned are 240. We've got about 223 full-time right now and 16 part-time. We have five audit divisions. Uh, we've got an advisory, you know, local government advisory services. Uh, we've got the financial audit services, which is the bulk of our work. Investigative audit, audit services, which are so, so needed in these day and age. And performance audit services, where we, we do a lot of fun projects and recovery assistance. And to tell you a little bit more about those, as well, we provide actuarial services. I was fortunate enough when I came in, we, we were contracting with an outside Florida firm spending, I don't want to tell you how much money to, for their consulting work. We have to review pension plans and look at all the 11 to 12, 13 plans in, in our state. So I was able to bring somebody from Texas with a lot of good credentials. Not Usually we ship people to Texas, right? But we brought some talent from Austin, Texas, and Kenny's joined us, as well as 
uh, we have we have a lot of legal staff. My executive counsel, Roger Harris, with us today. Also, is director of the investigative division. He's a, he's sort of my right arm in the office and and is a good advisor to me. But we also have like a, almost a mini law firm within this office that really guides and helps uh, those who have questions about compliance of uh, local laws and state regulations, et cetera. Um, our local advisory group really monitors and works with the outside CPAs who work with local governments, your towns, your villages, your cities, your police juries, your hospital districts, the various nonprofits that receive funding. You know, if you get a dollar of public funds, you have to report back to the auditor. You know, there's, there's, you know whether it's a, a sworn statement, a compilation, a review, or a full-blown audit, if you're receiving over $500,000 of public money, you have to remit an audit to this office. Now, we're known as the watchdog, and I get that. That's what we do. But as an outside CPA working and doing the audit work that I did as a practicing CPA, you always kind of feared the legislative auditor. You was always kind of fearing the call up there and ask questions. You don't want to expose your client. You're kind of talking in code. And, and really, I just felt that the perception needed to be changed when I came in. So I really worked hard to really roll out the fact that we just want to be your trusted advisors. That's what we do. We're all on the same page. We want to be give good advice and get ahead of a problem so that we don't have to, we don't have to create a, a major issue that makes the front page of the advocate. We want to help give people the comfort to call on us to advise them through an issue. And it's really worked. And we began uh, uh, educating the local government folks, the mayors, the clerks, et cetera. And we were holding educational sessions. We, we call it our Center of Local Government Excellence. It's more of an educational forum where we uh, recently, last month, uh, had nearly 1,000 people attend. I can only get 200 in a room, but of course with COVID, we learned this virtual stuff, how to do our meetings. Uh, virtually, and I was amazed at the participation and the feedback that we got. This is so needed because you have so much turnover with council members, aldermen, mayors, clerks, especially with the new crop that came in uh, just recently. Uh, we need to be out front and we need to be more educational with what we do. And that's a directive that, uh, you know, some hints I took from my legislative friends and it's, and it's really worked well. Uh, so. Our group, the, the, our, our, our local group, does a lot of that work, and and um, you know, and and they also monitor a lot of reports. Now, believe it or not, you can go to our website. It's lla.la.gov. Just look up Louisiana Legislative Auditor. You'll see all the reports that we receive. And, and for this year to date, we probably have received and reviewed over 4,000 reports. That's a lot of reports. That's a lot of. It you know, transparency and, and accountability that you can go to that shows the sunlight on what's going on in these different entities. Uh, performance has done about 21 reports thus far, investigative audits, which take a lot of time and energy, are about 14 reports. Our state, our, our staff that has produced the uh, state audits is about 98 thus far, but the bulk of them is what we monitor from the outside CPAs at the local level. I think we've got 3,871 3, reports that have been issued thus far. And I uh, ran into a guy named Paul Arrigo, one of your members. He's a, yeah, just recently retired, 20 years, visit Baton Rouge. I got a, I got a report. He wanted me to make sure y'all knew every one of his audits has been pretty clean. <laughs> He's done a great job, and, and you've been a good steward of public funds. In fact, I pulled it up to verify what you're saying, and you left a good bit of money in the bank over there. So good job, and I think y'all do a great job of, what, of, of uh, enticing convention business to come here and... Uh, and we really appreciate that. So those, you know, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but the ones that aren't attending these seminars that we provide or reaching out to us are the ones that end up in trouble, and that's where Rogers Group goes in to help clean things up. Um, on our financial audit side, you know, we focus more on the state agencies and higher education. You know, we take care of the university audits as well as state government. That's a task in itself. We issue the act for uh, coming, shortly we'll issue that this, this next month, or yeah, next month. Um, and then we focus on making sure that all these agencies have adequate controls in place and that they're complying with the laws and uh, federal laws and state regulations. Our investigative group is, uh, again, that's what they do. We, we probably field over 400 plus complaints a year. You know, we have to filter through them and see which ones are just kind of political in nature, which ones are real and, and very substantive. Uh, it takes a lot of work and time. We approach this like a criminal case. So we're working with the DAs, we're working with the sheriffs or police uh, 
uh, FBI or you know, potentially U.S. Attorney. So the, a lot of work in, it goes into that, and uh, they're actually the only division that can actually carry a firearm. You know, it's, it's, it's a special group within our office that, due to the high-risk nature of some of these interviews and places they have to go, they can, can, they can wear a concealed weapon. So uh, we have fun going to the range and requalifying. I hadn't shot in a while, and I, I barely qualified. So I am qualified. I'm not packing today. <laughs> But, but just know that your team is well trained. Um, a couple of interesting, you know, when I came in, we had a, they had an interesting audit going on with the fire marshal um, that was, uh, you know, just an example of a case that we worked that ultimately ended up, I think, in six, I think six indictments uh, handled by Tony Clayton, the DA in West Baton Rouge Parish. Um, there was basically a brother that was working for the state fire marshal, and, um, and he, you know, co- he worked with his other brother, who was an attorney uh, in that neck of the woods. And basically what they were doing is they were purchasing water during a Hurricane Laura event. And so things, things get chaotic. You're trying to move supplies, water, ice, et cetera, to, to take care of the needs of the, those who are in a bind. And so basically they were purchasing water for about 10, you know, 10, 10 to 16 cents per bottle and turn around selling it to the state for about $1.41 a bottle on average. Uh, so they had worked out a very intricate scheme, and uh, you know, a lot of money's ended up in uh, a law firm account. It was just really just a an ugly deal to take advantage of a very bad situation, which really, you know, doesn't help us when the federal government's trying to send us money and get reimbursed with FEMA. But that uh, that uh, that also involved other contracts and catering, et cetera. So it was it was a pretty big uh, it was a pretty big uh, steal that we put together. It was a very very long investigation with a lot of moving parts, a lot of entities and folks involved. Uh, but Tony Clayton will say, I'll tell you, he could have done it without this office's help. It was really a good, a good project. And, uh, and you know, it was, uh, we'll see how it comes. It's still, it's still in process, so I can't really get into a whole lot of details more on that. But another one was City of Oakdale. You know, Oakdale, quiet town in Allen Parish, you know, uh, you, you think everybody knows everybody? Well, this, this former clerk who for several years stole money, and you know, she basically created a steal with, through the ACH payroll, changing her payroll on occasion, paying credit cards, uh, personal credit cards, and, and various sums that probably, well, it summed to $897,000 over a period of time. Yeah, this, so this is Oakdale. I said, man, Oakdale must have a big budget surplus. Well, they, they really didn't. And <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, when, when she was confronted, not by us, but by the mayor, when they finally figured out what was going on, uh, she unfortunately committed suicide. Uh, but uh, we were called in to really kind of clean things up, quantify it, because obviously the city and the DA need to try to get restitution and, and uh, do what they can from, from the estate, et cetera. Uh, so that's just kind of two examples. Uh, and I'll just tell you that uh, I could probably use about 10 more investigators right now with the federal money that's, uh, that's been sent down in, 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 in a process of either spent or being spent. Uh, we're currently working some cases that will be, be, be interesting uh, as we're able to report those or make those public. So uh, it's just it's the nature of the beast. It's just the nature of the beast. So performance audit is a, is a really good little group. It's not all CPAs. It's got some, uh, some creative folks. That can, we have a few psychologists. and. Uh, uh, economists and, and really they, they evaluate the economy and the efficiency and effectiveness primarily of, uh, of the state agencies uh, or the executive branch level. However, we do a lot of special projects. Uh, one which is going to be uh, uh, first and foremost uh, on the legislator's mind as they convene is the insurance market. And we've done a few reports on the regulation of insurance companies and the financial condition of those companies. Um, big issue big issue. It's, it's at a point where your property and casualty insurance and your flood insurance in certain areas is going to be more than your home, your, your home mortgage. And so I don't know. That, that's, it's some scary times ahead with that. I'm not sure exactly what the end game will be, but we are doing some work on that. Uh, another project recently we issued a report on is the sufficiency of the transportation funding and impact uh, of that, that electric vehicles will have on that fund. You got more fuel efficient vehicles and electric vehicles. I think it's a 16 per gallon tax that was passed maybe back in 90. There's no, no inflation in, you know, in, index tied to it. So 
It's, it's, still, it's still growing, but it's going to get start, you're going to start to see a decline due to the efficiency as more electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles get rolled out to the market. So we're just kind of pointing the legislature in certain directions on, what, on er, areas that you may need to address. Um, the election integrity in Louisiana was a project we did. We, you know, after the 2020 election, we saw a lot of theories of, of things that may have gone wrong. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on the legislature to dig into Kyle Orwin's office, and, and we looked into it. And honestly, uh, they do a pretty good job. They, they did a great job. We, we gave a report on that. We made some recommendations that uh, they agreed to, and I think this past session they, they rolled out legislation to address those. Um, we've got some upcoming projects that we're working on. Uh, Department of Culture and Recreation and Tourism, we're evaluating them. You know, management of the tourist, uh, tourism dollars, including the grants and scholarship. You know, I think personally, I think Lieutenant uh, uh, Billy Nungesser has done a great job. He's a good ambassador for the state with doing that. But we want to make sure we, we're, we're they're following through on the return of those dollars. You know, what are we getting for the monies that we're spending in, in certain areas? Are they following up to make sure those dollars are being spent at, 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 at you know, the homeless house in a, in a proper fashion to bring in the, the tourists and do the marketing that ne that is needed. Uh, so that that's a report that will be coming out pretty soon. <clears throat> Other work, we're, uh, uh, projects we're working on, Department of Children and Family Services, DCFS. We, we all know we've seen the tragic news of, of loss of, of kids, and, um, and, and, and we're, we're seeing a lot of testimony about the morale and issues within the office. So we have a good way of doing surveys within those offices to determine what's going on, either at the leadership level, management level, or what's, what's, what's happening in the workplace. And we're also going to evaluate, uh, you know, how they're handling some of these complaints of abuse and neglect. So that's where, you know, the performance group is a very diverse group, educational-wise, so it, it takes a very diverse group to look into this. It's not just, you know, bean counter accountants, per se, but people that can understand the, the, the whole picture that brings a whole team together to do that. Another interesting project uh, is the Bell Chase Bridge project. Now, that is the first public-private partnership. It's known as a P3. You're hearing more talk about that. We wanted to look at that project to see, you know, what the best practice is for the next one. There's a big talk of that being the case for the new Baton Rouge Bridge. Uh, so that's, that's things that are happening now throughout the state with respect to consideration for P3. So we're working on that. Um, Justice Reinvestment Initiative, that's something that in collaborative we're working with PAR to, to get an understanding of uh, uh, there was, you know, that initiative to basically uh, early, either early release or just refocus the dollars. And, and uh, we want to make sure that the cost savings associated with what the legislature and the governor did is really being spent where it needs to be as far as reentry programs, and uh, I think even some of the new funding is going to uh, some of the technical schools to really help educate those guys that are maybe getting out. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's, we just need to figure out the impact and see where those dollars went and is it working. Department of Education, <clears throat> we're going we're to evaluate the oversight for special education services where we've had some complaints. Uh, on the ports, we're going to evaluate the, the economic impact of those ports. Uh, the industrial tax exemption program. It's a, it's a program, an incentive program to, to attract industry, uh, uh, primarily in the chemical corridor. Uh, we want to see how that program is being administered. You know, we've got uh, roughly, I think there's a, a revenue loss at the local level, about a billion five in property taxes. So, you know, there's debate on both sides of that. We get it. We just like to report it. We're not going to get involved in a policy decision or debate, but we're simply going to steer you to the, uh, the facts. And what's interesting about that is that Half of the industrial tax exemption is one parish, Cameron Parish. There's hardly anybody living in the Cameron Parish. So it's pretty interesting that about 700 million of that revenue is lost or could be given to as Cameron Parish, but what would you do with it? You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a, that's all part of the LNG uh, work that's taking place there. Another really interesting project is this Louisiana structure. We've got our, our, our Ed Siler, our PhD in a, in a you know, uh, economics, who is doing a study, uh, they're having a committee meeting as we hear, have today with a subcommittee of looking at the Louisiana's tax structure. Uh, there's talk of eliminating the corporate or individual income tax, and because they see the boom in Florida, they see the boom in Texas, they see the boom in Tennessee. So what we're doing is we're studying those states that don't have 
individual corporate income tax and seeing what well, where do they get their revenue or where you know where how do we backfill the buckets we, we do have to provide a certain level of, of monies back to the local level unless we restructure our property tax and give up homestead exempt so there's a lot of moving parts honestly I think it'll be a good study this year I don't know legislatively if they can get anything through but that's just my personal opinion I don't know they're you know they're working hard and doing a lot of work on that uh, it's going to be interesting to see how it compares, how we compare with other states. So look out for that report. I think we'll get some, some coverage on that as we release that one. Um, another big project uh, that uh, Ed's working on for us is, <clears throat> and this is more of a, a, a project that I came up with after looking at this insurance thing, and I, I mentioned insurance earlier, but there's talk of uh, creating an incentive fund. And one, after Hurricane Katrina, they did create hundred million dollars and put into a fund to re-incentivize insurance companies to come back into the market. So bring more private companies back into the market that would depopulate the citizens, uh, citizens insurance group. And, and if and, you know, they they did a great job of depopulating themselves up until these past hurricanes. Uh, so they were down to about thirty thousand plus in policies. Now they're probably over one hundred and thirty thousand plus in policies. And Citizen sits here today, and they're insuring, I think, close to, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's 33, I think it's 300, 33 billion in property. So I'm thinking to myself, and, and there's talk again of recreating that fund. Uh, to, I said, well, time out. Where, where, where should that money be best spent? Do we take $100 million and give it to, to Jim Dolan's office to re-incentivize companies to come in? Or do we take $100 million to give that to Citizens? Or do we take $100 million and give it to a, a, a fortification of home uh, project where homeowners in those coastal areas can apply for grants to fortify their home? Because what, what they've determined, which I think in the long term is going to be the best game, is if you can keep your roof on, you save your house. And, and that's what we have to figure out how to do, how to fortify these homes. Let's keep the, let's keep the roofs on and the windows shuttered and we can survive this Cat 4 storm. And uh, so... We're, we're, we're creating three buckets and trying to figure out where the, the, the best spend could be. Uh, there may be a combination of all three, don't know. Uh, so that's going to be, a, that's gonna be a, a study and a project that we're going to roll out hopefully sooner than later because the legislature, our goal is to try to get these reports and this information in front of the legislature before the next session so they can make some real decisions. Insurance is going to be your big issue. So we need to make sure we're doing our best to address that. Um, our last division, and I know we spoke about a lot today, the recovery, uh, recovery Audit Service Division was formed after Katrina, and that's where we basically look at all the, uh, the federal funding that comes in associated with disaster. We're still working on Hurricane Katrina files, believe it or not. So we have to make sure all the spend is done correctly in accordance with all those grant requirements, and so we probably have about 40 folks embedded be between GOSEP and CPRA, we also do work with them with respect to the uh, uh, rebuilding of the coastline. So uh, I think that's about it. I really, uh, I want to thank Tom for reaching out to me. Where's Tom? Reach out to, you know, he, he, and, I, he, and, his, he and his dad, Jess Wagsback, were the only, basically the only two, two CPA firms in a Sumter Parish. Uh, so we were kind of like the big fish in a little pond. So uh, I'm glad to hear your dad's doing well. And Tom, thank you for, uh, for inviting us. And, uh, uh, I see Dorsey Peak, my friend over there. You know, Dorsey knew me when I was a real bad kid at LSU and, and a very starving kid. She fed me uh, uh, quite a few meals, and uh, her husband at the time fed me quite a few beers. So we had, <laughs> we, we could tell several stories going back. Uh, other than that, I'm open for any questions if we have any time. I, I'm glad to be here and certainly appreciate the opportunity to tell you what the auditor does, and uh, we look forward to doing more. Yes, sir. Uh, not to get too into the weeds on this, but can we talk a little bit more about the depopulation of citizens and <clears throat> perhaps incentivizing companies to come into the state, especially with the insurance commissioner saying that he's going to sort of raise some of the capital requirements? What type of companies are we looking to bring in? Yeah, you know, I, you know I, that's more his purview, but I think what they're going to they're raise our requirements like $10 million, so that you have to have a reserve of $10 million, and, and so they may incentivize them by giving this company $5 million. That requires them to put up a $5 million match. They have to take in a certain number of policies. 
uh, and they have to retain them for a certain period of time. Otherwise, there'll be clawback provisions on that money. And as you know, there's a lot of debate on that. Uh, I mean, you've got companies like State Farm and Allstate that have been here through the trenches and done, done the work, have maintained the reserves, they bought the reinsurance. They're not, they're, not giving, they're not being given any incentives, so we're bringing new companies in. I think the real question, the real, the real regulation has to be how much reinsurance you require of these companies. Because I could come in, you know, you know, last year I could have had $3 million to go set up an insurance company. And I can just go cheap on my policies and bring in a bunch of homeowners, don't buy enough reinsurance and dividend out, dividend plenty out to my, my uh, di basically dividend everything beyond $3 million out to my shareholders or, my, or me personally. And going down the road and, and if we get a bad event, oh, we're insolvent. So if you're insolvent, then it goes to LIGA. So as a homeowner, I'll tell you, your best deal is buy your cheapest policy because what will end up happening, LIGA is eventually going to pay you a claim. You may have to wait six months or a year or two years to get your money, but if you can afford to wait, hate to say it, that's, that's what goes on. So LIGA then has to turn around and assess the companies to get this money. They're in a part in the process of borrowing or having, if they haven't done already, $600 million to pay uh, unpaid claims of these insolvent companies. So there really needs to be a real uh, watch of who we allow to come in and give money to to start business. We need to make sure they're buying the right amount of reinsurance. I don't know what that equation is, but that's another project we're looking into is, is trying to figure out the best practice of, of buying reinsurance and what should be required. Yes, sir. You talked about a number of different investigations. Are those mandated? Are you proactively searching them out? Or are you reacting to people's calls we, coming in? It, it, could be, it could be you calling us. It could be a legislature calling us. It could be somebody within the government calling us. It could be uh, uh, something that a CPA who's doing an external audit reports to us. It's, it's a whole hodgepodge of, of complaints that we get in. Like I said, we get four to 500. We document every one of them. We put them, put them in our incoming correspondence. Some of them we will send out to that local CPA who's in charge of that particular town or village doing their external audit. And uh, we, we prioritize. It's all about, you know, making sure we put the best resources towards, I guess, the bigger steel, and so that we can make sure we recover the funds or hold those accountable. So nothing's mandated. You know, we, we get to kind of, I guess you say we pick and choose, but um, uh, if, you know, it, it's a process. And it, there's a lot of complaints that are unfounded, like anything. You know, the sheriff's office gets calls of a lot of unfounded complaints. It's just somebody mad at somebody, you know. And so we have to filter through a lot of that. Yes, ma'am. I just want everyone to know oh. that it's a legislator <coughs> uh, trying to give birth to a more wonderful baby. Yeah. 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 Y
So uh, we 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 get a lot of those complaints and 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 we go after them. It, it's been been interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can tell you when a report gets issued by our office, it's the real deal, and it, a lot of work goes and it gets it's cross referenced. All the documentation's there, and as, as as we say in the auto world, it'll take time testify. And so it's there is a lot of there's a lot of stuff out there. You know, councils tend to take care of themselves, and, and if they can't tend, if, if 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 the bag continues, typically that's when we go walk in the door. You know, we've got certain towns right now that hadn't filed their audit report in four years. We're fixing to go knock on their door. And because, uh, you know, a lot of these folks, as we expected, got a lot of this ARPA funding in, and they're spending it like drunken sailors. They're not putting it into their water system or the sewer system. They're paying themselves bonuses and buying all councilmen a new vehicle. That, you know, we warned folks about that. Unfortunately, you just have got bad actors that just can do bad things. So we've got to go out there and do the work to hold them accountable. So I heard y'all had a hard stop at one. <laughs> Thank you for having me.